my apologies for speaking in English. I am attempting to learn Slovenian, but it is the language of geniuses and takes some time. Um, this evening I will speak in English. I will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. And I can give you in the first minute a description of what I'm saying in the subsequent 30 to 40, and you can therefore go home if you wish to. <laughs> Uh, most of my life I have worked in the communications business. I am a consultant to a wide variety of corporations and my job is to advise those corporations on how to influence public opinion. When the organisers of this exhibition came to see me at the beginning of the summer and explained what the exhibition was about, they asked if I would be prepared to say a few words, given that I work professionally in the communications business, which I was happy to do. Um, the words that I'm saying this evening are not ones that I would say if you were paying me. Uh, I hold a different view when I'm working than when I am not working. And what I'm doing this evening is reflecting on the issue of communications, but I hope that by the end of my remarks you will see that what I am really talking about is politics and in particular the politics of the recent period. What has caused what we now see in the media, the hysteria over the economy and what is the, un what is the background to that? And in order to start on that, what I wanted to do was to read to you just a couple of sentences from a book that was written 22 years ago, which is a book that is widely read in academic circles and is thought to be a predictor, to have made a series of serious predictions about some of the problems that we as a society are going to have from the extension of commercial communication into every other aspect of life. I have always worked in advertising and marketing. I know that area of work and I know what is involved in it. My concern is that a large amount of the expertise from that area is now moving into being used not for simple commercial purposes, whether you agree with that or not, but for the creation of public opinion in a way in which undermines the ability of us all to participate in any kind of democracy. Let me just read to you what he wrote 22 years ago. It is my intention in this book to show that a great media metaphor shift has taken place in America, with the result that the content of much of our public discussion has become dangerous nonsense. He was heavily attacked for writing that 22 years ago, but my experience indicates to me that much of the discussion that takes place in the media now on matters of great importance is much more influenced by the desire to exercise marketing and advertising skills than it is by a desire to engage in a genuine discourse. In other words, politics has adopted the mechanisms of marketing and advertising and uses them to deliberately create a degree of hysteria around a whole series of issues. So, one of the things that you should know is that people who normally talk about the sort of things that I am talking about this evening usually attack people like me. <coughs> um, this year, <coughs> um, this book was produced in the UK which contains, I think, two or three pages describing me as a terrible manipulator of the media on behalf of a capitalist conspiracy. Um, if this allegation were true, at least I would be a lot richer than I am. Um, but it indicates to me that people are becoming concerned in this area, and I think it's important that it is understood that those of us who work in marketing and advertising are as worried about what this is now doing to public discussion as those outside of it. Some of the things that have changed are obvious and yet we don't often notice them. 
30 or 40 years ago in the United States, and I'm using the United States partly because that's where most of the research is done, and partly because what has happened in the United States tends to have been followed by other countries on a time lag of a few years. In the United States 30 or 40 years ago, when a politician went on the television, the average time that they were on television was three and a half minutes. The last time that the appropriate research was done on this, which is two years ago, the average time on television in the United States on what is called face to camera is about three and a half to four seconds. It is not possible to say anything meaningful in three and a half to four seconds. All you can do is hope to influence the immediate emotion of the viewer or listener. What you cannot do is pursue a rational argument. Because the media has become shorter and shorter in its attention span, what has happened is that media coverage of important issues has become more and more emotionally driven and less and less rationally driven. Let me give you some examples of how this works. In the recent presidential election in the United States, and I make no comment on the victor and loser in that election, that's a matter for the Americans, I am commenting on the way in which the election is conducted. By the time the main presidential election itself got started, no other candidate, other than the candidate of the two major parties, stood the remotest chance of of competing in any meaningful sense at all. The cost per day of that presidential election exceeded the revenue of most of the civil society groups in the United States in a year. In other words, when it matters, what happens is all of the normal civil society groups get excluded and the candidates who can raise the most money tend to get the most, the most airspace and therefore to generate the most support. Well, I often hear, it was always like this. It is certainly true that in democracies, politicians necessarily and understandably want to gain as much sympathy and support as they can, and that they should use symbols and emotional language and rhetoric. My point is not that that shouldn't happen, but that it is a terrible thing if that is all that happens, and if there is no intellectual argument that run long, runs alongside it. Because it turns the elector, the voter, into a consumer of advertising and marketing, rather than a participant in a democratic political society. That if you allow your politics to be a competition in advertising skills, you are no longer a decision maker, you are simply a consumer of what they have decided you should receive. Is this analysis correct? Well, <clears throat> I am certainly not the only person presenting this argument. Somebody who does it much more coherently than I do, and has given it much more thought, is Al Gore, the Democratic presidential nominee in the year 2000 who in a recent book published in the United States argues that the way in which the media has changed in the United States has reduced ordinary people's ability to participate in elections and has led to people being manipulated so that they hold opinions which bear no evidence, that which have no evidence to support them, but then they were never given the opportunity to see the evidence. I suppose all of us can think of examples in the last few years of political decisions that appear to have no uh, rational evidence for them, but my argument is that decisions are more and more driven like that. What about outside of the United States? How is it affecting there? If you know that most people's votes will be decided by brief things that they see on the television, then you spend much more time devoting your election campaign to how you look and sound on the television than you do thinking about what the rational solution to your country's problems are. 
I would argue that that's true now in most countries of Europe, and as a guest in Slovenia, but an observer, I would have said it was fairly obvious during your recent general election that the subjects that are discussed tend to be driven by what is likely to influence short-term emotion in the elector before polling day, rather than a serious consideration of what those people might do were they to be elected to government. I am told that the last few general elections here, that seems to have got worse. All I can say is that the same thing seems to be happening everywhere else as well. If you believe that in a democracy, politics does require a continual discussion amongst everybody in the country with free and reasonable access to the information, this should worry you. It is not because that perfect state is ever achievable, but because we seem to be moving away from it. Some of the other things that seem to me to be driven by this development, perhaps I can remind you, the development I'm referring to here is that because of the way the media has changed, veering more and more towards entertainment, there is less and less time provided for serious discussion. This is for understandable reasons. Most people don't like watching serious discussion. The problem is if you allow your media to completely exclude it, you end up with a completely ignorant electorate which is exactly what some of the people who would like to manipulate us would most like to see the outcome to be. Well, that's my central proposition. I've talked for about 15 minutes, so I think I've got about another 25 to go, and I wanted to pick up on some practical applications of this. If I can, what I'd like to do is to just drop these sheets down here. I know there aren't many of them, but you can probably just have a look over somebody's shoulder or one of them. Um, in fact, I've just realised I need one of them back for myself. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you've got a few more at the back, I think. I thought you might be interested in this. This is a piece of paper. It was not drawn up by me. It's drawn up by people who are interested in this kind of issue. Um, when I am working with a commercial client, whether it's BP or Unilever or Shell or Pfizer or whoever it might be, what I say to them is that you have to remember that public communication has two elements, a rational element and an emotional element. And on this paper, you should be able to see that laid out. The left-hand side is the tr classic uh, discourse based on reason in which you put forward a, a proposition, somebody argues with it, there's a reference to evidence, data is assessed, and various forms of logic are engaged in. The column on the right is a different way of engaging in discourse, which is about driving people's emotional positions rather than their rational positions. In most reasonable discussion, and in most reasonable media, there would be a mix of these two. But I believe that over the last 30 or 40 years, if you look at the television coverage of things that are really important, you will see that that coverage has drifted from the left-hand column to the right-hand column. One of the ways in which this is quite concerning is that the research which is conducted nowadays to construct modern television advertising is far more sophisticated than I think most people who are not involved in that business realise. It is not at all unusual for us to test hundreds of messages with very complicated ways of assessing what people's emotional reactions are to the different messages. By the time the advert appears on the television, the sponsors of the advert will have done sufficient research to know with fair degree of accuracy not what you will think when that advert is played, but what you will feel. That's fine, except that we know that in biological terms, feelings often circumvent 
go round the rational process. And I would have said Europe's history over the last hundred years tells us that when politicians decide to play exclusively on emotion and to exclude reason, the outcome is rarely very good. It's usually a disaster. So why isn't more being done to both notice this and to stop it? Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's because there's some vast conspiracy. Excuse me. It seems to me that it is at least partly because so many people have a good reason not to notice it. That if you're working in the advertising or marketing business, you would do this sort of thing every day of your life. And it's very easy when you do it every day of your life to not step back and say, is this always being used in the way it was originally intended or a way in which I feel actually in my conscience comfortable with? I suspect that quite a few people in the industry are now concerned at the extent to which the skills of advertising and marketing are being used to manipulate public opinion and the dangerous consequences of that. I referred earlier to the consequences and I want to just speak briefly about two particular issues. If you watch the media coverage of the global economy over the last two years, I think you would see an extraordinary example of what I am here talking about. It was well known to a wide variety of economists at least two years ago that the housing bubble in the United States and the subprime mortgage market was going to lead to a serious economic crisis. It was repeatedly referred to by a wide variety of experts, nearly all of whom were then excluded from the media coverage. If you want to try looking that up, go to YouTube and just tap it in and you'll see there were dozens of them. <coughs> on Fox News, there was one particular commentator who appeared on their news program and said that he thought there was a serious problem with the mortgage market, that it was likely to go very bad and that this would have a huge impact on the banking system. The camera stayed on him, he was on a panel of four people, and then panned back. And the other three were all roaring with laughter, because it was such an absurd suggestion. If you watched Bloomberg News, which I do virtually every day, you would have seen somebody on that TV day after day saying the housing market is fine actually, it's really going very well, the market will go up by 3%, 10%, 50%, the numbers rose according to how many drinks they'd had before they went before the camera, I think. The problem was that they were not academic commentators on the housing market, they were estate agents, one after another. The media had gone to the people who would give the message that was the happy talk. Because if you don't say what people like, then they might change to another channel. That's an incredibly powerful cultural force. Because it begins to mean anyone who thinks that something is going wrong is going to have a tougher job getting media coverage than somebody who turns up to say everything's going fine. And I would argue that that is exactly what is happening. On the economy, some of the people who said the mortgage market in the United States is going bad and this is going to turn up to be an economic crisis included the former Secretary of Commerce, the richest self-made man in the United States, the largest owner of an independent trading company, the most well-known banking professor in the United States. It was the subject of a full speech at the United Nations which detailed exactly what was wrong. And yet, three months ago, every politician in the United States was still saying there's nothing wrong with the housing market. Banking's absolutely fine. I gave a speech to the one part of the management of Barclays, which is a major bank, about a year ago, and in the course of that speech I said that I thought that there would be a problem with the mortgage market. Not because I'm an expert in this area, that's simply what I've been told. 
The head of strategy for Barclay stood up and said, very interesting speech, but I can assure you we know there's absolutely no problem with the mortgage market. How can so many people have believed something which was manifestly wrong? The answer is, we have to look at what the media has done. The media has devoted itself to the process of providing people with happy talk. It'll all be better. Everything's going to, we're all going to be richer. We're all going to be healthier. We're all going to be this. You can have everything you want. Watch the adverts. Life, things can only get better, as the song says. If you create a discourse which only allows happy talk, you preclude people who actually know what they're talking about and say, we have a problem. Maybe we should address it before it destroys us all. That didn't happen with the economy and is an example of what I'm talking about. Let me give you a second one. Nearly every government in the world has signed up to pay for the collection of 6,400 scientists who have been working together for nearly 20 years looking at the issue of climate change. The conclusion that they have reached is that many of the activities in which humankind are engaged are likely to create a very major crisis, an environmental, ecological crisis. Whenever you see that discussed in the media in, say, the United Kingdom or the United States, it is discussed in terms which I can only describe as trivial. It's about, uh, should we or should we not use plastic bags at the supermarket? Well, there may be a case against using plastic bags at the supermarket, but frankly, in the light of what we're facing on climate change, that is an utterly trivial place to go. And yet there's a great deal of media coverage of it. Why? Because then you're not actually talking about what really needs to be done, a radical reduction in CO2 production in the developed world. It's another example of the way in which a serious discussion of what needed to be done would require people to make moral and economic choices which are not based in happy talk. And because they aren't, it's gradually reduced to a trivial subject in the media. Well, one of the things that's become more and more apparent in the research in this area, <clears throat> and which I freely admit I use in my working life, is that communication is also now being seen as influenced by several other factors, apart from the straightforward emotional one, and that is different people react to different things emotionally according to their genetic makeup. And advertising and marketing is now becoming remarkably sophisticated at creating communication that targets people in different genetic background groups. I don't think the general public are aware of the extent to which that is happening, and it worries me. Another example. Some of the research from marketing and advertising uses a, a, a relatively benign form of hypnosis, in which people have the smell of the product produced in front of them, in order that they can say what their subconscious reaction to that smell is. My point here is, we are now reaching a stage in which communication is designed to hit you in such a way that you don't notice it. Of course, propaganda has always wanted to do that, but it's now being done in a remarkably sophisticated way. It's <coughs> From this, it seems to me, three or four conclusions uh, flow. And I hope you like the word conclusions, because yes, it does mean flow <coughs> near the end. <laughs> three or four simple conclusions. The first is that we need to look very seriously at how politicians are allowed to use the media. We need to look urgently at whether the rules and regulations about the way in which politicians communicate with us are designed for the benefit of democracy or for the benefit of the politicians that happen to have already achieved power. In the United States, this is becoming a very big issue. 
But as an outside observer, I would have thought it should be an issue both here and in every other country in Europe. We need to make sure that general elections do not become a competition in sleazy manipulation of allegations of one person <coughs> against another and are actually about what the long-term future of the country can be. It can never be perfect, but at least reason should get a look in. Two, that we need to be very careful during a period in which the media is giving huge coverage to the global economic events to check that what we are being told bears some relation to the available evidence. And in some of that media coverage, I don't think it does. Some of that media coverage seems to me to talk about a rebound in the economy at some point in the next 18 months. About six or eight weeks ago, I was at a meeting in London with 20 of the best economists in the UK. None of them believed that there would be a rebound in the next 18 months. Some of the best economists are saying we're in for a recession that may last as long as 10 years. Why then does the television continually tell us that this will probably be okay and there'll be a rebound in 18 months' time? I put it to you that it is actually about controlling people's emotional reaction to that news rather than telling people what is actually going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, although I'm frequently tempted to be one. I think that these things are happening not because people are planning that they happen, but because different people in different walks of life are doing what they've always done, but they're being used in different ways. And that it's time that we stopped and said, is it appropriate that politicians and the media should treat democracy in the same way as they treat selling toilet rolls? I don't think it is. And I think that we should insist on higher standards in the political discussion. We should on, insist on the media using people who have a critical view of what is happening rather than simply the mainstream view. And that we should ensure that the discourse is not driven towards hysteria, but sees as hysteria as something to be avoided. Now, having finished that, I'll happily take questions since I think I've destroyed my career in marketing and advertising. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, at least three observations, but I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, the first one is, uh, I don't agree with you that uh, people, uh, people as such are, ten tends, to, tends to like the, the spectacle. Uh, we have, uh, in, in ancient times, we had uh, Greece where people liked to participate in political uh, talk and debate and discourse and deliberate. Um, I think they, ha they have been driven in that way and the second observation is that I don't agree with you that um, media as such uh, are to blame. I think there's a deeper foundation for that and uh, it comes from financial, financial and uh, economic uh, problems. I say problems because I don't agree with them. Uh, but I, I think that's the, that's the foundation where we should uh, start to change things uh, because without that uh, the media will stay the same. You're basically talking about regulation and you can't regulate uh, media that are commercialized, that, that go only in, in the way to uh, expand the revenue of their marketing uh, uh, so, that's for, for the start. <laughs> uh, to the two points you make, that the public don't demand the entertainment, then why is it provided? Um, if you go to the United States, in the average city there are 40 channels. That's just the main channels. And if you go for the <coughs> Monty, you can get 200 channels. The competition between those channels is cutthroat. It's really ruthless. What you want is the maximum number of viewers because what you make your money from is how many people you, your adverts are seen by. The reason I prefer that explanation is this. 
If you go down the route of saying it is driven by people who are doing it for their own economic motives, consciously, you end up very quickly in a conspiracy theory. No, they're, they're just rational. It's rational to, to act in that way for normal of, of a business. And, yes. people, and, and people look at media as their business. And I agree with you, it's much easier for people to watch entertainment. It's easier, but it's if they were critically... Uh, if the public, public schools were, were, were teaching them to act critically and to think critically, they would, they would uh, be able to see through that. But the, the, the main problem is, uh, look at how much uh, money goes to the public uh, schooling. We're going in the opposite direct, direct direction. I, I think I'd come about halfway to where you are. I do think that there is a problem that people are not trained in using critical thinking. I agree with that. But I also think that there is a fair degree of public demand for entertainment in the media. And that the media meets that demand because of the advertising drive. So I agree with you that it is a rationally driven thing. I think what we're talking about here is the difference between common purpose and conspiracy. Common purpose is where lots of different people do what's necessary because it's in their individual interests. I think that we're agreed on that. Where I think we might differ is the extent to which they talk to each other about it. They don't. That's they don't. The, the final outcome is yes. irrational. Yes. We're, I think we're probably nearer than, than you think. <laughs> I don't think we're far apart. Um, I also think that if you want people to look at this critically, you've got to be quite careful not to adopt language that alienates people. Um, but in, in other words, you've got, to, you've got to be able to say when discussing it with media, I, a lot of my work is actually talking to reporters. And if you go around saying, you know, you are a tool of the capitalist conspiracy, you don't get a very meaningful discourse. But if you say there is a problem with the media coverage, it's driving our thinking in one direction which may be unhealthy, then I think you can have a reasonable exchange with them. But I'll happily debate this with you on another occasion. <laughs> Could you make a comment about the, the internet and possibly its capabilities of um, being an antidote to the, the mass media? Yes. <clears throat> Two comments in a way. The first is I place a hell of a lot of hope in the internet. Um, <clears throat> I use the internet a great deal. I use a number of sites for people who are involved in my business and various other things of that sort. And one of the things that I know is that the internet can be a fantastic tool for ordinary people to take power back. And to some extent that was happening during the recent US presidential election. Candidates were making claims which were being completely demolished within an hour by a network of experts in each particular area operating through the internet. So I do believe that the internet can become a means of re-democratizing some aspects of our society. My second point, however, is on the other hand. On the other hand, the problem with the internet is that it has no established means of indicating authority or legitimacy. Everybody's opinion is roughly the same as everybody else's. That is both its power and its defect. Because just as it can become a network for intelligent thinking people to become critical of what's going on, it can become a network for people with a very narrow point of view, uh, whether it's extreme nationalism or whatever. Um, so the, the internet can put lots of different people in touch with each other and help them become a critical mass, or it can frankly find lots of different lunatics and get the lunatics all talking to each other. So <laughs> there's a strength and weaknesses, it seems to me, in that. Do you think it should be a difference between uh, so-called national uh, um, networks, TV networks, as our national television here in Slovenia, BBC, uh, mm -hmm. RAI, uh, and uh, the commercial ones. Because if you say that something should change, the public opinion should influence those, so-called national, no, 
Yes. It can be called national televisions, and they are certainly not, or shouldn't be, uh, uh, should be influenced by government. I mean, national television in terms <coughs> like our national television, BBC, and yes. Like, um, I, I'm strongly in favour of national TV because I think that if you allow TV stations to develop which are genuinely global, I think you've taken another plank away from people's understanding of their own politics and their own locality. Now, I also think that for democracy to work, you need reinforcing factors about your own culture. If there, there, I know there is a view that says the more people lose their national culture, the more we're all the same and therefore there will be less war and so on and so forth. I don't agree with that view at all. It seems to me that upholding your national culture is part of being an individual who can participate in a political debate, not a block to it. So in that sense, I think national TV is extremely important. The great concern is how do you fund your national TV in such a way as to prevent the politicians corrupting it. That's a problem everywhere. In the run-up to the Iraq war, on a relatively minor BBC radio station, one reporter made a mistake, which was corrected an hour later on the same radio station. But the mistake was critical of the government. Within days, the government had sacked the chairman, the board of governors, and the director general of the BBC. That kind of political control really worries me. What worries me even more is not a single journalist resigned. That really is bad news. Um, I don't know what the solution to this is. I'm arguing for a free and independent media, but I'm afraid I don't have any easy answers as to how to achieve it. My point this evening was, just from my own perspective of marketing and advertising, I can see that this is not going in a very healthy direction. I don't think it's necessary to have an answer to occasionally be able to point to the problem. And I think part of the problem is that the media won't allow people on to point to the problems. Uh, I think the problem Marco was referring to is actually that uh, the television, uh, the public television, is more uh, state television rather than the public television. It doesn't uh, fulfill the interests of the public. And if we accept the thesis you were uh, somehow pointing out as well, that uh, the media is uh, working as an uh, ideological state apparatuses or mm. apparatuses of other, I don't know, economic forces, the owners and so on. Uh, where is then, if uh, the recipients of the media messages are mostly passive, where, where is then the solution to uh, evoke the critical debate to change the state which we're in, in win, uh, which we're in, how to, how to change the direction? I suspect that the economy is about to change it for us whether we like it or not. That it was possible for people to go along without being terribly critical of what was going on because everybody felt they were getting richer. Um, if people feel they are getting poorer, I think we can be fairly certain they're going to get more critical. <laughs> now, whether that criticism will be levelled in a rational and productive way is a separate question. But then I think we all, as individuals, must do what we can to partake in that discussion. My fear is that if the economic downturn in Europe is as bad as I personally think it's likely to be, people's critical faculties may get worse. The last time the economy crashed like this, 1929-1930, people did become far more critical, but it was a criticism of democracy. That was the problem. I hope that that doesn't happen this time around, but it obviously has to be a threat. Um, again, I can only say to you, I don't have answers here. <laughs> the good thing about coming to talk at an art exhibition rather than talking in a business context is I don't have to have an answer. I can only keep saying, look at the problem, look at the problem. <laughs> It's a million dollar question. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Okay, sorry for asking you since I'm the cameraman, but I take the <laughs> chance you being here and being in a small round. I've got two questions to you. Um, 
since I believe, and uh, what you stated uh, sounded very much like, that uh, media can have the influence on personal as well collective life, like a drug, yes. with the same effects. So um, there isn't no um, media cause, media education to treat with media as an essential part of life in public school yet. So my first question to you is whether this should be the case in order to um, yeah, bring uh, the possibility to children to become real citizens, aware citizens dealing with the problem. The second question is, um, it refers again not to a statistic but something I have to say I remarked that um, within the time like the, the last 10 years where uh, media became so much more a way of our life and I think it's part as well like with mobile device and everything so it came very close to the people and the internet and all this came into the sleeping room like in the same time there was a lot lot more talk about depression as a general problem, as a um, problem for people itself. Can it be that people are so confused that they don't know what to de decisions to make to in order to um, get a happy life, a meaningful life, like that? So, I think that I can only give you my opinion on those two points. But it isn't just my opinion, I think it's the opinion of quite a lot of people, not the least of which is the author of this particular book, and Al Gore and a number of others. Is it possible that watching the television is actually changing the people who are watching it and changing their culture? Yes, in my view it is, both. Does that <coughs> change the way that people deal with each other in a private space as well as the public space? Yes, definitely. When the media changed from script, from handwriting, to print, it changed not simply how you got your information, but how you saw the world. The Protestant Reformation was in part a consequence as well as a cause of the arrival of the printing press. Because once you distribute knowledge in that way, you get a new argument about authority in religion. The old argument had been that there are relatively few copies of the Bible, you'd better listen to the priest when he's telling you what's in it, uh, and his interpretation will go. Authority. If you make a Bible available to everybody, you've, per you've fundamentally asked a question about the nature of authority. Why am I talking about events in the 16th century? Because the media change changed the culture and changed the way people thought and felt about themselves. And the change that has come about as the introduction of radio and television is also fundamentally changing our culture, but we're not really noticing it. When I was a child, when I got home, at the end of my school day, I sat down at a dining table with my family and we talked about what we'd done during the day. We had uh, a, a prayer before the meal, grace as it's known in England, and a prayer at the end of the meal. And during the meal, my brother and I were required to come talk to my mum and dad to say what we'd done, and they, we had a conversation of at least an hour and sometimes two hours. The same thing happened in every house on the street in which I lived, and in most towns across England. In the most recent survey in the UK, only one in seven homes has a dining table at all. <laughs> that is a change in culture. Culture comes from transmission from one generation to another. To transmit from one generation to another, you have to talk to each other. And you're not talking to each other if you're watching the television. You are acquiring a culture which is not that which is transferred verbally between one generation and another, nor the values that go with it. You are acquiring a culture that is created for commercial and political purposes. That's my point of this evening. Does that lead to people getting such things as depression? I think the evidence for that is overwhelming, yes. If you actually look at the numbers, what you will see is that as the media spreads, people perceive themselves as becoming happier, 
but in fact end up chasing things. And it doesn't make them much happier. I'm not arguing that everybody would be happier or poorer, but I am arguing that a culture <coughs> that is devoted to the acquisition of material things and only the acquisition of material things is in deep trouble. Would doing things in school help with that? Yes, it could do, and I would certainly be in favour of it. In other words, would it be possible to start talking again about values in school? Yes, I think it would, and I think it would be worthwhile. I think the problem is there would be a huge argument about what values you should be talking about. But what I want to avoid is a society where values are set largely by electronic media, largely influenced by what the commercial positioning of that media is. So talking to kids might help, but it won't solve the problem. Sorry, that was a really long answer to your questions. <laughs> that it? Well, look, thank you for... In, I'd like to thank the organisers of the exhibition for asking me to speak for a little while this evening. Um, I admire them for organising this event, this whole event. I know how difficult it is to do this kind of thing. But it is important, even if it's only a few of us getting together and discussing ideas that maybe don't get discussed more commonly. So thank you very much, and I hope I can still work somewhere in the marketing advertising. <laughs>